Thank you. If I could just remind um, those who are watching this online, uh, please submit your questions via Twitter using the hashtag uh, pound BAC pension. Uh, we've already been receiving uh, questions from online uh, viewers, so please continue to send those in. Um, I thought I would start, um, you know, some of the nation, you started talking about the math, and I think there is some disagreement about the math. I know the, the state treasurer has recently uh, made some statements about the math, so I was wondering if we, if we could talk a little bit about the math. <laughs> I believe so, that's right. So uh, I wonder if we could have a conversation about the math and, 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 and where we are exactly. Is this on? Yeah, there it is. Okay. Um, there, I wouldn't say there's disagreement about the math. There's a gross misunderstanding about the math. Uh, and I'll point to what I believe is a misunderstanding by the state treasurer. I think that Dave uh, didn't quite get it in his comments today either. Uh, what people say is, well, gee, your, your study at Stanford said you should use a risk-free discount rate or a risk-free investment rate. I would ask people to look at that study again. We never said that. There's a difference between assets and liabilities. And when you have a liability that is an absolutely guaranteed payment, which defined benefits are, then you need to discount those at a risk-free rate. It has nothing to do with the investment rate or the rate of return. You need to separate those two. The problem is that GASB, the Government Accounting Standards Board, requires people to join the two at the hip. And if this were in the private sector, you'd split the two out, you'd look at that, those liabilities, you'd look at the rate of return, and then you'd come up with your number. That's what we did. So we've never suggested that anyone would earn 4.14% per year. However, having said that, if you don't cherry pick numbers like CalPERS and others do, that's the number you get for the last 10 years. In fact, if you want to know what the investment rate of return should be, if you want to make that assumption, you really ought to go back, I think, 100 years. And if you go back and look at capital markets in the last century, 1990 to 1999, the return, this includes that big run-up from 82 to 99, the biggest run-up in the history of the markets, you end up with 6.2% investment rate of return, far less than seven and three quarters percent. So no matter what you do, I mean, the, you know, the math is the math. So again, I would ask people to go back, look at what we've done, and distinguish between liabilities and assets. I know I have, a, have a different perceptions of that, so if I just want to chime in that um, I heard I heard Joe say CalPERS cherry-picked their numbers and then he picks the last 10 years <laughs> and and the last 10 years of course are the numbers that uh, are based on uh, the, the bottom falling out of the market so you know when we talk about cherry-picking numbers I think it, it cuts both ways Okay, two out of three falls, guys. Uh, yeah, I, I look, we, the, the number I gave of 1.3 billion, actually, uh, our actual, our actual, Mr. Bartel, used CalPERS numbers. That's including the 7.75 they believe that they can average over the long haul. And the money that we're paying right now in additional uh, contributions to be able to make up for the in investment losses, and we're responsible for all the losses as an employer, uh, it doesn't even keep pace. So we're paying about 80, 85 million dollars a year plus another 10 or 12 on top of that. That is like a negative amortized mortgage. We're still falling behind. The principal is still accumulating. If anyone really thinks that you're going to work your way out of this by just through investments, I think you're sadly mistaken. We do need these. These numbers speak for themselves. You have more people leaving the system than coming in. Higher benefits, higher salaries. It's it's, it's obvious what's going to happen here, and we all, should all at least acknowledge that we need change. Uh, I think, I don't want to rehash all the causes. I don't, I don't, I don't know if it necessarily suits us to go back through all the causes, but I, I do think there's some disagreement about about certainly where this comes from, and I you know. Um, Harvey, you mentioned about the, the, the economic downturn, the financial collapse. How much of that, the, the, this, you know, going from a problem to a crisis, how much of that is a result of this financial downturn? How much is it a result of these other factors that have been mentioned? 
Well, I think as I mentioned, we went from some 260 billion down to uh, <clears throat> 130 billion, if that's what I indicate. Excuse me. It was a decrease of from 260 to 160, and now it's up to 230. So CalPERS uh, did make some bonehead real estate investments. <laughs> One of which was Syveson Village back in New York City, cost some $500 million. So there was a composite of uh, market downturn. I think if you look at your asset allocation, they have a greater flexibility, more aggressively now than before. So uh, that's my comment. A lot of the presentations touched on the point of fairness. I know in some of the other public comments, is a, there's this notion of fairness. And I was wondering if we might try to reach some agreement on what fairness means. Uh, and, and we talked about a public employees paying a, a fair share. What, those of you who've used the term fairness, what, what, how, how do we think of fa fairness in this context? Um, can I sort of raise those two questions if it's, if it's all right? Um, I think there's, um, I mean, I'd like to know if there's a system out there besides the public employee system in California, that generally pays people more when they're retired than when they work. That's pretty tough. It's pretty hard to have a system where people actually earn more in retirement than when they're working. And even in the examples that Dave put up there, if you do the math, the, the, at least one example I did, the individual actually would receive more when she was retired than she was working, assuming that she started, you know, in her mid twenties and retired at, at the age of most people retire. And so, you know, that certainly doesn't happen in the private sector. Now, I think you have to step back and ask that, you know, if your questions about equity and fairness, you really have to ask about about salaries and benefits combined. And that's a little tougher question. People in the public sector do earn more, but generally the skill levels are higher uh, than in the private sector. Uh, but certainly over time, that gap has, has grown. And, and I think people on the private sector side want something that, uh, you know, they, they're, they're looking at this and because they see, as Jeff Adachi pointed out, all these cuts in services, they're looking at something that's fair to them as well. And I think it's hard to argue that a system uh, that pays people more when they're retired uh, is uh, than when they work is fair. Yeah, well, one of the uh, research, the research study we're doing right now is an actual comparison of uh, private public benefits and full compensation, including uh, value for compensated time off. And we're mapping to the top eight employers in numbers in, that are headquartered in, in California who are also on Fortune's best places to work list. I was very insistent that we not cherry pick that we use those criteria as a large employer based in California on the, on the, and we will be coming out whatever it comes out and, and our report will probably be out by April 15th on the comparison of full compensation including benefits. So first of all, I would agree with Bob Foster. There's, there's, there's no single cause here and I don't think any of us uh, on, the, on the labor side that, that I talk to believe that uh, there's a uh, nobody has to be uh, involved in the problem uh, solving from our side I think that as I've talked about you know we have been at the table and there's no advantage for us to have our employers go broke they don't have any money they can't pay people uh, my members believe in the same public services that you do they want good schools they want their kids to have a better future than than, than they did so, um, you know, there's a community of interest there, uh, but, you know, I think there's, there's uh, every side has to put a little skin in the game here. And, you know, Joe's right. Somebody can retire with more than they made when they're working. For one of my members, they'd have to work about 45 years in order to get to that formula. Um, you know, is, is there a solution that says you can't make more than, than, than when you're working? Certainly willing to talk about that. So my school secretary that was making $2,500 a month when they were working would cap out at $2,500. Still not exactly an exorbitant pension to live on in California. So, you know, if they want to talk about those types of solutions, I'm willing to come to the table. I, I think fairness is, is, a, is a relative term. I, mean, I, I have a good friend who is a uh, full-time public safety officer. I think he pulls 
maybe hundred twenty, hundred thirty thousand dollars a year. He's also a full-time attorney, and uh, he was incensed that uh, you know under Proposition B, you have to pay nine dollars a month for his health insurance. So it all depends on on what your perception is. I, I had this other uh, person I've known for a long time. Uh, he was a high-ranking police officer in the San Francisco Police Department. Uh, he made five hundred sixteen thousand uh, dollars last year. Now keep in mind the top ten police officers in San Francisco, not including the police chiefs, chief, earn an average of 247000 a year. And so they retire with 90% of that. And, and, and he was outraged about Prop B. And, and you know, so it all depends on, 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 on what your perception is. One thing I think is true in, in the polling, and this is in San Francisco, so take it with a grain of salt, but it, it showed that uh, people are very much supportive of pension reform and health care reform but they don't want it uh, to hurt the, the low-income workers. And I, and I think you know they've made a very good case about that, that if you're talking about somebody uh, who's barely able to, to, to make it by, then yeah, it isn't fair or it isn't as fair uh, to require them uh, to pay the same as a higher paid employee. And that's one of the things we learned from Prop B. And this time around, uh, we've uh, put income levels uh, in there to exempt uh, certain workers. One of the things they said in the campaign, the average city worker in San Francisco earns $93,000 a year. And one of the things they said was, this is going to hurt workers who earn less than $35,000 a year. And that's true. Now, there's only 15 of those out of 26,000 city employees, but that's a very good point. And we're going to make sure we make those changes this time around. So again, fairness is in the eye of the beholder. Uh, what I really think we need is greater citizen involvement in this whole process. And recently, the city of Pleasanton uh, conducted a pension workshop. And what they did was to break out their situation in two parts, what their pension liability is, what their uh, operating budget is. So they made this presentation live on the web. It's still on their website. And it's something uh, to kind of go through so all citizens of each community can be aware of what their liabilities are because fairness you might say uh, we want we try and attain perhaps a 75 percent of initial uh, buying power when we worked but this is going to vary person by person just a, a comment I, I don't think we should only be informed by some of the the more outrageous examples that we all know about, and we certainly have them in our city in Long Beach, the people receiving substantial pension uh, uh, income after they retire, uh, sometimes in excess of their salary or close to it. Uh, and I think you have to be careful that the, the people who do the day in, day out services that we all depend on are, are ha do have a retirement that they can, that they can rely upon. But I think something we have to think about in general is how what all this conversation today is talking about when I retire, will I be able to make close to my salary? That was never the intention of retirement plans. They were always designed to supplement your savings. So fairness would also dictate that there's a little bit of self-reliance that has to go on here. And people can't just count on a defined benefit plan for their entire retirement. You do need to have some savings. That's a sensible thing to ask people. But I also think we can't just point out, you know, people making two and two hundred fifty thousand dollars in retirement as the norm. Now more of those are coming in the system, but we do need to protect people that are doing a, a job at much lower incomes. And I think we have to make sure that they have something they can rely on and can count on. And that's what this discussion should be about, about having a system that's sustainable and preserving those benefits for people. I, I'd like to just say something um, that, that, Dave, that Dave's example, I think how many years did that um, employee work that retired uh, prior to 65, I, I believe it was 18, um, the average retirement, if you add in survivor benefits, is over 30. So when you look at the amount of time worked versus the amount of time retired, that's why we're in a, we have such a, a high expense, is we don't have enough time to put the money away while people are working in order to pay them often twice the number of years that they've worked in retirement. 
Some of the proposals uh, that are on the table, I understand, and, and have in, in localities as well, exempted certain types of employees, including police and fire on, on some occasions. Which is, is that an appropriate uh, exemption? To exempt police and fire or other, other categories of workers? Very brief. You can't <laughs> exempt police and fire. Police and fire are 68, 69 percent of our budget. We're trying to hold the line at that to make sure we have other quality of life services, but you cannot solve this, at least at a, I think at a local government level, without having police and fire involved in this. It has to change. Uh, in my conversations with, with police and fire representatives, they're not asking to be carved out and exempted. Uh, this sort of divide and conquer strategy that that is being engaged i think that they most most of the at least that are their leaders understand that you know you can you may get carved out today and then you reduce everybody's benefit and then they'll come back after them later i think that everybody on our side would like to see a a solution that is fair to everybody uh, as opposed to a uh, uh protecting a few people and, and 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 goring somebody today and then you know, carving somebody else out tomorrow and going after somebody else, that's, that's not a strategy that we see as a solution. That's just a, sort of a cannibalization. I mean, w one thing, for example, in San Francisco that we see is because the retirement benefit is so much higher for police and fire, it's much more expensive for the city. And so the contribution rate might be, you know, in some cases, two or three times as high uh, than for uh, non-safety uh, employees. And the reality is, if you talk about fairness, that means that the um, uh, non-safety employees are essentially going to subsidize the benefit uh, for public safety employees, and, and that's just a reality. And now the politicians, they don't want to mess with public safety. And so, you know, I don't know if you saw the Chronicle uh, yesterday, they had a big story about how they racked up over, I think, a billion dollars in vacation and overtime and everything in the state prison system. I mean, that's outrageous. And yet, the politicians won't do anything about it. But the Little Hoover Commission, some of you cited the study, obviously they, they've uh, gained some attention in recent days about their proposals, where they, they talk about aggressively changing the system. Uh, they cite what they call the elephant in the room, the legal obstacles that limit the options uh, to future employees. Uh, what do we do with, with current employees? We're doing a study, um, as I mentioned, and we are getting some legal analysis. We're looking very closely at a court case in Baltimore where in, in, in a fiscal emergency, the judge agreed to impact current employee, em, employees by lowering their, their benefit formulas for work going forward until that emergency subsided. So what we're looking at is the possibility of a proposal to declare a fiscal emergency uh, and under certain parameters, and then that enables the employer to uh, to change benefits going forward, knowing that if we were to uh, put this on a ballot initiative and have it approved, it will go to court and it will be challenged. But by mapping the language very carefully to a successful case in Baltimore, uh, it will it will increase the chances of that um, of of getting a, a favorable decision. Uh, this is a the issue of changing the unearned pension benefit going forward. As I mentioned uh, briefly, there's precious little you can do in the short term to make sure that you have the, the, the resources to run a city or run a state government. You can ask for more contributions from employees, and I know gratified that the state employees have stepped up to do that. We're doing the same thing in Long Beach. And, and that's really all, all you can do, and they may be remove some of the fluff that's in the system in terms of things that spike salaries. But in the short term, you're left with more contributions from employees or changing the benefit going forward. Uh, and I, 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 at least in our city, I believe that you will not solve this. You won't put these pensions on a sustainable path unless you address that latter issue. I realize it's difficult, but remember, years ago when these pension benefits were enhanced, they were made retroactive that benefit wasn't earned either. So if somebody in 2001 that worked for 20 years for the city of Long Beach and the pension benefit moved from, I believe it was 2.3 or 2 to 2.7, they got credit for 2.7 
for the entire period they worked in Long Beach. Clearly not earned. So I think you have to look at this and address it fairly. It's the only way you can obtain some revenue and some resources in the short run to run to run the government. This issue has been tried, tested, decided at the Supreme Court, um, not once, not twice, but numerous times. Supreme Court in California, based on California law, not Baltimore law, has stated that you cannot impair the benefits of an existing employee because it's a vested right. Uh, unions didn't make this up. It's not something we created out of whole cloth. It's uh, state constitutional law. It's the Supreme Court of the state of California. Uh, and it's been decided numerous times. And uh, our position is, is that it would go to court and our feeling is, is that it would be decided uh, against that, uh, that precedent. Just to pick up on what Dave said, <clears throat> there's a decision pending before the state Supreme Court right now regarding Orange County deputy sheriffs and Orange County, a 37 Act County. Uh, it's a question of whether it's perceived to be a gift of public money versus a settled practice. This would, uh, it's kind of interesting in the sense that the governor, uh, as attorney general, filed an America's Curie for the public employee side. Now as governor, as part of his uh, proposal, is going forward, any future contracts, uh, let's just say we would not, service would be based on the service earned in terms of any future contract Im improvement. So that currently is, is pending. So this is something that's uh, a concern of retirees because uh, in the unlikely uh, possibility that it's settled for uh, Orange County, this would have an impact on all California retirement system. So we are concerned uh, with this type of case. Uh, real quickly, just on the math of this, it's about, I think you have to include current employees. You have to do this going forward. Um, the, the, the numbers suggest that um, that you could get perhaps 20 to 30 percent of your savings out of this. So it's not, it is not the only thing, but probably 20 or 30 percent of the um, rescue of the pension funds would come from those existing employees. I want to ask a question about timing because um, you know, I know in the state of the city address you talked about you know, this is the time to solve this, recognizing that probably 10 years ago was, was the better time to solve it. Um, is it appropriate in the context of, uh, certainly at the state level, with the current uh, debates that are going on around this year's budget, is this part of this year's discussion about this year's budget to talk about long-term pension reform? Well, you know, in, in San Francisco it's been interesting. It's sort of maybe a microcosm for what is to come. A year ago, people were not talking about real pension reform. After Prop B, um, I think one of the things that we achieved is people are talking about it, but public education is key. One of the things that we're gonna be doing after this meeting is convening a group of statewide um, pension reformers. And this is a first meeting and a first effort to talk about how we can share resources, how we can develop and design uh, solutions and create uh, a dialogue uh, among those who are interested in, in looking at this problem. And you know, this is not a San Francisco problem, it's not a Vallejo problem, it's not a San Diego problem, it's not a Long Beach problem, it's everybody's problem and it's happening everywhere. And so there is a good reason, you know, one of the reasons that, that, that I am so concerned about what's gonna happen in the future is that we're, uh, there's gonna be layoffs of city employees. Last year, we saw that we lost a couple hundred here in San Francisco. This year, we might be looking at, at as, as many as a thousand layoffs, including uh, as much as 20% of my staff at the Public Defender's Office. You know, we're not gonna be able to do our work. And so we have an interest in solving this now. And uh, again, you know, I mean, we're seeing what's happening with the teachers being laid off, school employees laid off. I mean, there's not gonna be anyone to pay into the pension system uh, if, if all we care about is making sure that we uh, pay that debt every year. Um, 130 local agencies already have 
negotiated two-tier benefits and rolled back benefits. There, uh, I checked over at CalPERS. There are currently, I believe, 300 requests from local agencies for a lower tier of benefits being costed out right now by their actuaries. Um, as, we, as I stated, state employees who represent uh, probably close to a quarter of the public employees in the, in the state of California have already rolled back their benefits. So it's, it's already happening right now. Uh, I, it is a widespread problem, but I would disagree. It's not everywhere. I mean, there are agencies that didn't increase their benefits um, 10 years ago. There are agencies that are 90 percent, 100 percent funded still today. So, um, you know, they've managed their assets well. They do not have a bad experience. So I, I would just uh, assert that it, it's it's not everywhere. It's it's uh, it's what's getting the press everywhere. But uh, there are still a number of uh, uh, agencies that are, are still in relatively good shape. Uh, during the last year, the economic collapse, we had 30 uh, agencies that adopted a second tier. We had over 200 increase their benefits, one of which was my city of Citrus Heights, where we're based. The city council members gave themselves retroactive pension benefit increases. Within that year, uh, one of our city council member members was appointed by the governor to the uh, the Gam Gaming Commission uh, at a salary of 126000 a year. His 13 years of part-time employment at $7,200 a year is going to give him an additional an additional 45000 a year in his pension when, when he retires in a year. That's an additional million dollars he's going to get. This is what's happening. Yeah, we're talking about second tiers for new workers, but we're also enhancing benefits for current workers all over the place. Could, could I just comment on this on this question of whether there are agencies that, that are out there that are in, quote, good shape? The, 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 the city that I know out there that is in the best shape is Fresno. The city of Fresno is actually in respectable shape. They probably have the best funded ratio of any, any city out there. I don't know how they got there. But, but um, I, I, I've got to take off in a minute. I want to make sure I got this comment in. Let's assume that these systems get the rates of return that they say they're going to get. Let's assume CalPERS gets seven and three quarters. Let's assume they get seven and three quarters here in San Francisco. Everyone gets hits their mark, and they hit that mark on average. You know, I mean, you, you can look at their historical performance, and you project out 15 or 20 years, which is the average duration of liabilities. What are the odds that those systems will be in good shape, that they will actually have enough money to pay what they owe. In the case of CalPERS, even if they hit seven and three quarters percent per year, they have a one in four chance of being able to meet their obligations. A three in four chance that they will not have enough money over the next 15 to 20 years. And frankly, CalPERS is in better shape than most of those, of those at, the local, uh, at the local level. So, you know, it is an absolute fantasy to suggest that there are systems that are in good shape, even the ones that are in relatively good shape. Uh, I don't see a way out of this unless they make significant changes across the board. Calibers has done quite well the last two years. Uh, in fact, they've earned over 12 percent. So recognizing we have both upsides and downsides that I think uh, the probability being it will be more than 7.75 percent. We've gotten a couple of questions about the, the, the politics, so I'm going to uh, sort of push a political question, which is, um, you, know, you mentioned earlier that the public is on, on your side. Where is the public on, on pension reform? Uh, the, uh, the surveys I've been, that, that have been shared with me show over 80 percent of the, pub, the uh, likely voters um, will favor pension reform. But the devil, again, is in the details. Uh, that's why it's really important that our organization survey those details to see what's going to move the dial uh, up or down. And fairness is very important. Uh, I think most of the surveys I've seen have showed a, a large public sentiment for changing the system and having pension reform. But I also want to caution everyone. Uh, I think one of the worst things we can do here is do pension reform that lasts for two or three years and then you're back at it again, that will just increase the cynicism out there. I'm also under no illusion that we're going to implement, for example, the entire Little Hoover Commission report. Uh, as, as salutary as that may or may not be, that isn't going to happen. We're not going to solve this in one huge pension reform. But I would 
at least urge that whatever does get done has to have at least a significant duration. Uh, and you may even want to put it in phases in the future because it's difficult to take in one lump sum. But uh, what I worry about is having what's called pension reform, and then two or three years later, the this, this system is actually really in even a as bad or worse shape, and now you've increased cynicism. And at that point, I have to tell you, I think things get very, very serious for people in the public sector. And, and, I, and I value what's done in the public sector, which is one of the reasons we need to do this. So our coalition has been looking at this issue for almost a decade. Over that period of time, we've done numerous polls. We've done an incredible amount of research. We've done focus group testing, and we update our research on an annual basis. And you know, we've seen the shift in public attitude. Uh, 10 years ago, there was this wasn't even on most people's radar screen. Um, it's obviously gotten to people's radar screen. Um, when we come, when we ask about the, the question about your position on whether this is a problem, more people see it as a problem now. And people do. If you ask them just the, just one question, you know, should we reform the pension system? Uh, the vast majority say yes. The big issue is context here. You know, what type of reforms do they b believe are good reforms? Because um, if you if you lay out very specific reforms the, and, and, and actual benefits of people and what they are now and what they might be cut to under various different reforms, the answers you get in the polling are, are very, very different. Uh, so, you know, if, if, if people want to interpret the, the one question poll that people believe in reform to, to mean that you can go throw any proposal out there and they're going to vote for it, uh, I, would, I would say that that's uh, completely inaccurate based on the research we see because uh, there are, you know, there are, they are concerned about having good teachers and firefighters and cops and, and, and uh, public employees working out there at a fair wage and at, at a fair retirement. And I think, you know, as, as Mr. Adachi has experienced there, they also are very concerned about the, the um, uh, regular working person who's just trying to struggle and make a living, who, you know, basically are, are, are the types of members uh, I represent. So uh, the polling, uh, the, the type of question you ask, uh, is, is very important in terms of the answer you get. So uh, one of the questions we received through the, the Twitter feed, this is the Nixon goes to China question. Uh, Governor Brown received millions of campaign dollars from, from unions. Can you realistically initiate pension reform in California? I think you hear him often say that uh, at his age, um, he's, uh, you know, feels like he doesn't really uh, owe, owe anybody. Uh, he, he He's He's put he would he put pension reform in his uh, in his election agenda. You know, he campaigned on pension reform. We expect to see pension reform from the governor. I think the, the difference probably between uh, electing uh, Governor Brown and, and, and a Governor Whitman is, is that is that hopefully we'll get a chance to sit at the table and and uh, and shape some of these as opposed to having uh, things uh, imposed on us. Brown was better on the pension issue than Whitman was. Remember, Whitman was going to carve out public safety, um, and and I, you know, Brown doesn't have a, a choice on this. If you look, I mean, if you just look at state debt, for example, the the total state debt, general obligation bond debt, debt is seventy seven billion. Forty billion dollars we have because we've quote kicked the can down the road because we've moved money from funds to you know other funds. Retiree health care probably they say fifty two billion is probably closer to a hundred billion. The pension short, so you get to about 200 billion for those. The pension shortfall is probably between 200 and 500 billion. So, I mean, he doesn't have a choice. He has to deal with this, whether it's this year or next year or for every year of the next eight years, <laughs> which may be the case, he's got to deal with it. I think there's a microphone that's on the floor. Questions, yes. Uh, did, what, what specifically are you willing to do from the I need to repeat this just for the, for the Twitter for the feed. So the question was uh, for, for Dave Lowe, what, what would you do to fix the, the pension system in California? Well, first of all, I, um, you know, I'm not the, uh, the pension czar. I don't get to select the fixes for, for every uh, situation. I think every situation is unique. I represent a very specific type of employee. The, the state is paying 9.7% as a, as a, uh, of total payroll for, for the pensions for, for the people I represent. I would assert that at the benefit levels my, my members have, 
they're, they're, they're probably, the state's paying probably the lowest percentage of payroll for, for the members that I represent uh, than, than anybody in California is probably paying. So, um, you know, uh, I, I would, uh, for my members, I would absolutely stop the, the spiking and the abuses. I don't think there should be pension holidays. I don't think that it should be a revolving door. Nobody should be able to retire on a Friday, come back to work on Monday and receive, a, you know, a, a, a pension. You know, there should be a, 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 a realistic waiting period before somebody can come back to work. And they should continue the limits on how, uh, you know, how long you can work when you come back. Um, the uh, unfunded liability for, for my members is, is lower. The, the, the funded status, I believe, for school employees is, is probably approaching about 80% right now, which uh, under every single rating agency is considered a, a realistically sound funded status. Um, I don't speak for, for every other organization in our coalition in terms of the solutions that they would put forth for their members. I would say that the solution needs to be commensurate to the problem. Mr. Dachi, you mentioned about the unfunded health care costs in San Francisco. We have a question from Twitter that unfunded health care costs are a bigger threat to the government to government finances. And we was asking for each of you to comment on that. Yeah, absolutely. Because, you know, one of the things that I think we were criticized for during the campaign is, you know, why did you take on health care costs? Because you have to. If you don't take on health care costs and you only take on um, pension costs, you're solving less than half the problem. And Craig Weber is here, he was on the, the San Francisco Civil Grand Jury and they studied uh, this issue in 2009, 2010. And you know, the, the sad truth is that everybody in City Hall knows about it, but no one wants to talk about it. Now that's changed. I mean, since Proposition B, the unions have said they're gonna solve this problem. Uh, you know, the mayor's office has a task force, you know, and, and so everybody's now talking about pension reform, which I think is a product of what we did in the November election, uh, the awareness of the issue. But um, there still isn't any good plan uh, for pension. In, in the measure that I'm uh, putting forward, what it will do is require city employees to contribute a percent of their salaries towards the unfunded liability. That way you're funding the problem. And it's very different than just requiring city employees to pay more uh, for their health care, which is what Proposition B would have done. This is actually taking uh, money and funding the health care costs, uh, so uh, there is money in there to pay for these costs uh, when they are accrued. Your thoughts on the unfunded health care liability? Anyone else? Uh, yeah, the unfunded liability, um, the, uh, I've seen studies that by virtue of having a retiree health benefit, it gives you a motivation to retire early. Um, we could handle this problem by just simply increasing the retirement ages at which, at which people are able to collect to um, draw their um, retiree health benefits. Um, and just an an answer to David, why a reason your the reason your uh, rates are so low is because the school employees tend to have a higher turnover than other professions, namely uh, teachers and cops and firefighters. They tend to work longer, a full career. They don't go in and out of their career, you know, over a period, over their lifetime. And and that's the beauty of a defined benefit plan. That that's the devil. That's the devil uh, that a lot of people don't know. When you have a high turnover, it's a very low cost benefit to give to your employees that that come and work a few years and then leave because you can spread that cost over a lot a lot more employees and it's a very low cost to you as an employer. Um, so that's why you're you're lower, Dave. It's not necessarily that your benefits are lower. You're you've just got higher turnover, and people don't. Um, I think they work an average 16 years in in the school profession versus an average of 30 if you're a copper firefighter. First of all, I would I would assert that that's incorrect. The the, the reason is is because we have so many part-time employees who. Uh, so the these 16.8 years, because 50% of our people work part-time, uh, many of them are working. Um, you know. 30, 35 years in order to get to 15, 16 years of, of service credit. Uh, if you look at the turnover numbers within the schools, that, that, that there's no data to, uh, to back up that assertion. As a matter of fact, the data would completely refute that. So that's a complete conjecture based on absolutely no facts at all. Uh, secondly, um, our members don't receive, uh, for the most part, uh, fully paid health care in retirement. So um, 
the vast majority of my members receive nothing or very little in retirement as uh, uh, paid, paid by the school district. So the unfunded liability for, for health care is going to vary again from uh, agency to agency. I understand that San Francisco has a, a, a very, very uh, a generous program um, in, in terms of, of retiree health care. And, and um, I mean, health care is a problem. The cost of health care is going up for everybody. The projections are in the next decade, the cost of health care is going to double. Um, it's, it is putting us underwater in the private sector, in the public sector. Something needs to be done about it. Now, you know, personally, my solution is a single-payer health care system. I think everybody should get health care. We, you know, we're the, uh, one of the only developed nations in, in the world that doesn't provide health care for everybody. So uh, obviously, I'm a little bit more progressive than most uh, in this room on that issue. We have a question in the back of the room. Sure. Um, Bart Hughes from the city of Pleasanton. We were the catalyst behind the workshop. Uh, specific question to Mr. Lowe and then a broader question. You had referenced, uh, and I don't mean to pick on that one example, but you talked about your particular group is funded at an 80% level. I was curious if that was based on um, AVA or MVA numbers. And then the broader question is, and we, we address this in Pleasanton, is you have two different numbers of unliability depending on what valuation is. and. For those in the audience that don't know here, um, essentially what CalPERS did is they've taken the losses and they spread that over, out over the next 15 to 30 years. And my broader question is, what's the efficacy of that? And um, just what's your take? Is that fair? Is that moral in terms of what's going on here and how these numbers are being represented? So to answer your first question, I don't know what what it's based. That's the CalPERS valuation. Uh, is 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 uh, whatever they use is, is how they're calculating the the eighty percent funded level. Secondly, I would point out that uh, the investment gains are also spread out over the same fifteen years. So it's not like they're cherry picking the the, the losses, spreading it out, and then absorbing all the gains. Uh, you know, in in a, in a lesser period of time. So uh, in the last two years, CalPERS has has gained uh, over double digit uh, returns, spreading those out over the over the same fifteen year period, rolling and that uh, they've regained $75 billion of the losses over the, over the last two years. So, um, you know, it's like you live by the sword, you die by the sword. It's not like that they're using selective uh, time periods. Uh, just on the general question, I can tell you that uh, our actuarial has, uh, has, has informed us that we would be well advised to pay an additional amount in addition to what the smoothing that CalPERS has put in. I think they did it quite frankly because they're at least at the local level their member agencies simply couldn't afford what would, uh, to make up those loss payments in a three or four year period so they put the smoothing in which is why you have sort of a negative amortization you never really catch up so we're embarked in long beach i mean I, we're going to try this budget year even though things are tight to make a an additional payment to try to make some dent in that unfunded liability and again you heard here today when you're sitting in a situation where 86 or so percent of your costs are personnel, the only way, the only tool I have in the short run is to get, is a reduced, reduced personnel costs. So that's going to either be furloughs or layoffs uh, unless we get some reform movement here to be able to make these payments. Hello, uh, my name is Ned Moritz and I'm a resident of Menlo Park who helps get through the recent uh, initiative with 72% of the vote uh, to go to a two-tier system, and that's all we could do. But I have a question related to what Mr. Foster talked about, and that was for long-term change. And it not only includes what we can do with current employees or future employees, but have any of you thought about how we should restructure the, uh, the governance of CalPERS in terms of, uh, and We've seen some public uh, reports on malfeasance and uh, other issues, but clearly it's been a system that's not worked as well as either side probably would want to see it work. So the question is about long-term structural change in the governance of CalPERS. I, I'd like to, uh, you know, one thing, that being a nonprofit and being who I am and out of government, I get whistleblower reports all the time. Um, I think governance is absolutely essential. We We need to get... Uh, um, you know, independent uh, uh, people without a financial interest in the decisions and the policies that they um, that they pass. I just got a report that there's a system that I can't reveal who it is. There's a system in California that does zero 
and I mean zero reviews or turnarounds of obvious spiking. Uh, they, 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 get comp they, they keep track of compensation over the years with their members. They get that bump up in final pay. They do zero. By comparison, CalPERS, under pressure because of reporters showing, talking about police, the police, uh, the chief's disease a few years ago, um, and, and things like that, and spiking. CalPERS last year had 12,000 claims for retirement. They questioned 7,000 that were outside of the parameter that caused them to question whether spiking had occurred. And in fact, they adjusted uh, 5,000 of them, and, and 50 of them were, were act actually, this is right in the Hoover Commission report. But they, but they questioned 7,000 out of 12,000 claims, and 5,000 ended up being uh, adjustments downward. And yet there's a system out there that's doing zero, and I don't know if that's the first one. They, they take whatever they get as reported final compensation and just pay a benefit based on it. Uh, I, don't, I think there's no question that the governance needs to be changed at, at the PERS system. I think you need more representation from the employer side. You need more independence. I think we ought to have a requirement that people do not have at least as little self-interest in the outcome as possible. I think the Hoover Report outlined that pretty well. I think there needs to be change there. I don't have a particular formula for it, but I think it has to change. On the longer term issue, uh, you know, I, I think it, it, the what, what I what I was attracted to the Hoover report for. But I think they did a, in my judgment, an intellectually honest effort. The, they didn't they didn't do the politically correct stuff. They called it the way they saw it. Now, we may not like the solution, but if you go back to principles, I think there is a principle that you have to have some defined benefit for people. I think that's important something that they can count on. It may not be at the levels we have today and shouldn't be, and it may even have to be lower in the future. Coupled with something I talked about, which is some self-reliance and self-discipline in a defined contribution plan that would supplement that defined benefit plan. And then finally, they laid this out for federal employees where you have Social Security to add that. That's a That spreads the risk around in a more manageable fashion. It, provide, it requires people to have some savings, discipline their own behavior, uh, and still provides an adequate retirement so that people can live in their in their later years. Uh, I think that's something to look at. I'm under no illusion that that's going to happen this year or next year. But ultimately, the weight of these systems, I believe, despite what's been said here in some cases, I think the weight of these systems and the age bubble that's in the in, in the country today is going to require something like this. That's a much more manageable system. Might put, spreads the risk out, I think, in a more, a more equitable, an equitable way. Robin said that he had a response. Having uh, worked at CalPERS for some time and attending um, their board meetings, committee meetings, uh, monthly for some years, we're, you know, very disappointed in terms of what has happened in terms of some former board members, uh, former CEO, the allegations that have been made. One of the uh, reform efforts has to do with an ethics hotline whereby anyone on the outside or in, in the inside, they in fact can register the complaint and there's a monthly report that does go to the CalPERS board that in, provides a summary of each of these issues. So that is one way of CalPERS is addressing the issue. I, I would point out that first of all, CalPERS doesn't establish benefit levels, they administer them. Um, and that for decades, CalPERS has had been touted as as uh, one of the best boards, uh, pension boards in, in the in the nation. Granted, there have been problems recently. Um, the former CEO was uh, was terminated at CalPERS uh, in, in in part dealing with these issues. I would also note that changing the CalPERS board makeup requires a uh, a ballot measure. Uh, it, it, uh, the current makeup is established in the Constitution. You know, we're running short of time, so I wanted to uh, personally thank you to the panelists and, and uh, thank our host. Mr. Wonderman's going to give some final final thoughts. And uh, thank you, uh, Corey, and thank you, uh, folks on the panel. Um, we're into this for a couple hours, and we're all still here. And although uh, there are sharply uh, divided views uh, that you all heard, I think we did hear some commonality, that things do need to be different and that fairness has to be part of the equation. 
and that uh, it, that we, we're all part of a great state and we need to work together one way or another to get to the end game. I would say that uh, you know, this isn't really a new issue. When I, when I went to work for Mayor Feinstein, I used to have hair back in the 1980s, I had some at that time, um, I was in the budget uh, uh, department and I, at that time we didn't have much in the way of computers and so when we figured out uh, how much the police department cost or the fire department, we had to take the wage of a police officer or firefighter and add the benefits to it. At that time, in the uh, mid-1980s, if you had a police officer in San Francisco who made $50,000, you added about 93% to their salary. Their benefit level was 93% of their salary, so 50000 became almost $100,000 to pay for an officer, I was told. And a firefighter was 108%. 108% of their salary, so 50 became about 105000 or something like that. And I asked, well, how could that be? And I, was, I didn't understand anything about what I was doing. I was just told to do it. And I was, and the, well, we're underfunded. Well, what does that mean? Well, there's not enough money, as the actuarial says, there's not enough money. The reason for that, uh, it's not new, there's nothing new, is that at one time, San Francisco uh, had a very rich system. And so folks put in place this system and they gave a level of benefits which wasn't sustainable. And when the economy went down and the rubber met the road, everybody said, oh my God, we can't keep paying this. So they went to a different system. They added a different tier. And it ta as Mayor Foster would say, it, it doesn't hit in right away. And so, because you're still paying out based on the old tier. And so, you know, we were broke. And we were broke largely because we're paying that kind of dough. And then as time goes on, people forget. And they say, well, this isn't fair. And well, labor unit, there's, I don't know, 8,000 jurisdictions in the state. All of them have their own agreements with labor. They all want to have parity with each other. And so over time, it is predictable that the, that the benefits will rise as they have. And then the rubber meets the road again, and you go back and you get a second tier. And, and so what we have is cycles of employees who are either over-benefited or perhaps uh, I would say, uh, I would probably stipulate in the case of Mr. Lowe's uh, people he represents, under-benefited. Uh, poor people who are trying to scrape it out, and you know, I, I don't dispute uh, the statistics. Joe Nation is not here more. He, I think he's right. I think a lot of this is, is in the math. Um, and I think, you know, perhaps this, although this is a big challenge for us, it's also a heck of an opportunity to work on this together. One thing we know about our state is if we don't solve a problem together, and together means through our representative government, which is the California State Legislature, then the people will solve it for us. We'll have an initiative. And people are getting pretty upset. Um, this is uh, this you know, this is uh, this is very much on the radar, and I don't think it's going off anytime soon. So there's an opportunity, I would say, to the panel and to those of you in the room, who are watching this stuff and involved with this, to come together. We met with Speaker Perez yesterday. Uh, there is, I think, an absolute interest in him. He, he is the leader of the assembly and others. Uh, Governor Brown last week to deal with these issues and and to actually look at the math and see what's fair and you know, take care of some of the problems so we don't have to read about these, you know, these hard abuses that are just absolutely indefensible people. Uh, Perez asked us, and I'll ask you, what is the highest pension in the state of California? What's the highest, come on. Five, yeah, well, as you heard, it's, it's over, people couldn't even get to the number. It's over $500,000 a year. And there's a lot of folks at $300,000 a year in that level. But you know, if you look at the, at the averages, this is an awfully big state, it doesn't average out to anything like that. And there's a lot of folks who are, who are eking it out on their California state pension or local pensions. And the key is, I think, you have to look underneath it and you see after which unit, which tier, which, and, and, and see if we can kind of figure out what's a, what's a fair and equitable system that preserves the state's uh, economic and fiscal interests at the same time as fair to employees. I think, based on what I heard, and I know a lot more about this now than I did a couple of hours ago, that this is eminently achievable. This is something we actually can work out if we put aside our, you know, our emotions and we sit down at the table and we hammer out uh, this issue. And we work with the legislature and we insist uh, that this be taken care of soon. Because if we don't take care of it soon, and cities like Long Beach and ones closer to us here in Northern California start hitting uh, the problems that cities like Vallejo have hit and head for bankruptcy or something looking like that, um, then the public is the public's, uh, is not going to take this. 
So this is, in fact, the time for us to do something about it. As a head of a, an organization that's dedicated to the success of the region, we intend to, uh, to, to be involved in this and to do something positive that represents, uh, that re really reflects, rather, part of the, the greatness that is, that is our state. Let's start turning this around, Let's focus on this issue, and make it happen. Again, uh, thank you, uh, Professor Cook. Um, thank you to the members of the panel. This was a very informative and I think very robust and healthy discussion. Let's have more of this and let's get this solved. Thank you for everyone who came today. Appreciate it.